So I was going to give you guys a quiz. I'm still going to go through it, but you know, you've seen the answers. So the first question is, who is this guy? Very good. So uh, yeah, it's Darwin. And uh, so in the 1850s, he published The Origin of Species. And in the, uh, and in the 1950s, Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA. And we've come to think that the fundamental agent in natural evolution in the natural world is the gene. Okay. All right. The next question, anybody who gets this wrong fails the exam, especially in this room. Who's this guy? <laughs> Turing, right? It's Turing. So, of course, in, Turing in 1930s published his paper on the Entscheidungsproblem, thereby launching computer science. In the 1950s, Stephen Clinney proved the recursion theorem. And when he uh, published that, it was clear to anyone who cared about these things that uh, computers could reproduce and they could evolve, all right? And uh, uh, that the uh, analog of the gene in the natural world was the stuff stored in computers, right? Which I came to give a name to scenes, okay? And this is a portmanteau uh, from uh, computers and genes, scenes, okay? And so scenes are the analog in the computer world of genes. All right, third question, who's this guy? Hey, somebody said it. Richard Dawkins, okay. So in the 19, late 1970s, he published uh, the, a wonderful book, The Selfish Gene, okay? And in the last chapter of that book, he pointed out that the stuff stored in our brains could actually reproduce. And it reproduces when, for example, it's transfer, a new copy is made in a new brain, right? So I'm reproducing some of my memes into your brain right now, yes? Okay, and he called the uh, agent of this process, the stuff stored in our brains, memes. Okay, so uh, a little bit of a, an aside. So when Dawkins' book came out, I was at MIT teaching a course in uh, theoretical computer science to undergraduates. And I had this kid in my class. He was 20 years old and uh, very energetic and enthusiastic. And one day he came into my office and he says, uh, Professor, I want to be a theoretical computer scientist. What should I do? And I said, well, here's what you should do. You should finish your degree here. Then you should go to Berkeley in graduate school and work with Manuel Blum. Okay, and of course that kid was VJ, and uh, and he did exactly those three things, right? Uh, right, VJ? Yes. And and so on that basis, though I acknowledge some small contribution from VJ and from Manuel, uh, you know, he became a distinguished professor. Uh, uh, Mostly, the pivotal moment was that moment in my office. And so I, <laughs> I want to claim at least partial credit for all of his great achievements. <laughs> right. okay. So back to this stuff. When I read Dawkins' description of memes, I said to myself, oh, that's how it all works. Okay. This had a huge impact on me. For me, this was the hat trick. I was seeing exactly the same thing three different times in very important areas, right? And I've spent the last 40 years thinking about all this. I really have. And some of you who you know, deal with me on a regular basis know that it's, you, know, you can't get away from this. This is the rhyme of the ancient mariner for me. Memes and genes and all this stuff. Okay. So, I had planned to 
develop a grand theory of all this stuff. Uh, I didn't succeed in that, but I did succeed in growing old. Right? I mean, this is his 60th birthday. All right, so, so what I did is I decided to write down what I had learned in those 40 years, and the result is that book, Memes, Genes, and Scenes, a, a draft of which you can get on my website now. All right, so in this book, I address many things, but four basic things I do address. Okay, first is, do these things have a common theory? And of course they do, right? All right, second thing is, what are these things? Okay, and in thinking about it for a long time, I discovered that these things are part of a much larger set of things called preens, another portmanteau from primary and genes. That includes scenes and, and genes and memes, but other stuff as well. Okay, the next thing was, what laws govern preens, all these things? And of course, the Darwinian laws apply, uh, you know, mutation and natural selection. But uh, I came to understand that at least among the biologists and people I dealt with, the whole process of mutation and natural selection was almost universally misunderstood. So, it, the, what we think of as mutation and natural selection is, for the large part, not right. Okay, also I discovered that there were additional laws yet to be determined that also govern these things, these preens. And, uh, you know, so those are in the book. And finally, I was interested in how preens and preen theory manifests itself in the real world. You know, does this matter? Okay, so I, obviously I can't do too much in this talk, but I wanna do some. Okay, the first thing I wanna do is give you a sense of what a preen is. Okay, and uh, once you start down this path, you're gonna run into, inevitably, uh, deep philosophical questions have, that have been around for a thousand years about the nature of universals. You also get into some questions about set theory, but I'm not gonna to touch on those. So I'll be content if you have some sense of what a preen is. So, what is a preen? Another question for our exam, what's that? Shakespeare, a little more specific, can somebody get? Hamlet's soliloquy, yeah. yes, you, uh, right. Okay, so anyway, uh, there it is in a first folio edition from uh, 1620 approximately. And uh, here it is, a screenshot when I downloaded it to my computer, okay? And here's Laurence Olivier delivering it, right? So it's all Hamlet's soliloquy, but on the left, it's stored in a book. In the middle, it's stored on a computer. Therefore, it's a scene. On the right, well, on the left, uh, it is stored in, in uh, Laurence Olivier's brain someplace, in a way science has yet to elucidate. Uh, but then it's a meme, right? Stuff stored in brains. Okay. Now, uh, let's go a little further. What's the smallpox genome? Well, the answer is it's also a preen. Okay. So, we find it, of course, in the smallpox virus, where it's stored as the sequence of nucleotides in a DNA molecule. But here is another screenshot from my computer. This is its sequence as A, T, C's, and G's on my computer. And, uh, you know, therefore, on the left, it's stored in a, as a gene. On the right, it's stored as a scene. Okay. So, uh, the most important thing to know about a preen is its current copy number. Right? So, for example, there's lots of copies of Hamlet's soliloquy. Millions of books probably, millions of computers have it, and you know, I don't know, tens of thousands, maybe more brains have it stored, right? So it has a very high copy number. Okay. If the copy number of a preen drops to zero, that preen has gone extinct. And it's the fate of 
all prions to go extinct. All right. So for example, it's well known that Shakespeare wrote more plays than we have copies of. All right. And so unless somebody you know, discovers under a rock someplace something, uh, pretty much we can be pretty sure that the preens in those plays have gone extinct. All right? So th preens do go extinct. All right, here's the first sort of basic principle derived directly from Darwin, but applied to all preens. Principle number one, law number one, if you will. All preens struggle to avoid extinction. Okay, they all do. So it's easy enough for us in light of Darwin to see that uh, the smallpox genome preen has struggled to survive because the smallpox gene uh, virus has struggled to survive and it carries that, right? But has Hamlet's soliloquy really struggled to survive? Has it? Well, to answer that question, uh, you got to read the book, but here's a hint. Yes, and in exactly the same way that the smallpox genome preens struggle to survive. They all do it, they all do it the same way. Okay. So uh, let's turn to uh, some of the applications of this in the real world, and I just you know, have time to touch on two of them. So, here's the fourth part of our question, uh, of, of your exam, and this one I don't think you got the answer to. And if you get this right, you get an A in the course, okay? Who is that? Bingo! What's your name? Ar ah, congratulations. Her name is Rahimi, Rahima Banu. And that's a picture in 1975. You can see the pox on her. Okay. She was the last person on earth to have smallpox. All right. So the reason she was the last person is that vaccines have been around for several thousand years for this purpose. They got better as time went on. And uh, and in the 1950s, the World Health Organization said, wherever there's a outbreak, we're going to go in, flood the place, give, vaccinate everybody, and keep it from spreading. And so when the last virus died in Rahima's body, um, that was the last virus that was in any human body. And after five years of having no outbreak of smallpox, the World Health Organization announced smallpox is dead. It had been eradicated. This is one of the greatest achievements of all of humanity, of all civilizations, right? Smallpox had killed billions, is a good guess, people, and now it was gone. Okay. Uh, however, in about three years ago, I published a, or yeah, published an editorial in the New York Times the gist of which is, no, it isn't, okay? It's not dead. And, and the difference here is whether you, you understand the broad view of preens versus the narrow view of biology, genes, right? Okay, so let me explain to you why it's not dead, and it will never be. Well, never is too long, but close to never be. All right. So here's what happened. Just before that last virus died in Rahima's body, they took a blood sample, right? And that blood sample uh, ended up being stored in, now I think, samples of her blood in Russia and the United States. Now, of course, that means there's actual virus in some lab, uh, but that's not my point. Assume all those guys are, are eradicated, which many people advocate, right? Let's just get rid of them. Assume they got rid of them. You still have not eradicated a, uh, um, smallpox, and here's why. In 1994, a team led by Craig Venter, he's the same guy who led the team to do the human genome, sequenced the uh, 
that genome. And so you can now download it. You could do it right now. I've downloaded it, right? So the smallpox genome is now a scene that is stored on computers. And as we know on the internet, once that happens, it's never going away, right? Okay, so, uh, but, turns out a lot, there's been a lot of technological advances since then. And now it is quite likely that given that sequence on the computer, one could recreate the actual DNA, double-stranded DNA, and rebuild actual infectious virus. I mean, in fact, I considered doing that with HIV, and it would certainly have worked back in the early 90s, okay? But I didn't do it, you know, because why do we need that, right? But will, will anybody do that with smallpox? Well, you know, we could hope no one ever would, but, you know, you figure it out. So anyway, if somebody does, this is real virus that will really infect people. And if released back into the world, a now unvaccinated world, because we don't vaccinate anymore, right? Why would we? We're going to start all over again. And maybe another billion people will die, right? And so the point is that this is an evolutionary miracle, but it's a preen miracle, right? It's the most miraculous evolutionary step I am aware of in the whole history. So what happened is, just before that last virus died in Rahima's body, the smallpox genome preen found a new host. And that new host was a new species that had just evolved in the last 50 years called the computer. And it got stored as a scene, right? And now we're with it forever, and it's a, it has escaped us. It'll be there forever, all right? So you don't see that unless you have a broad view, a pre-theoretic view. Okay, let me give one more example of how this works. Um, so this is, you know, based, this story is based on the fact that a single preen can find itself in many different physical objects, right? right? Now let's look at what happens when a single object becomes the home of many, many preens. And the most dramatic example of all that is you. So let's look at your preen set. Okay, this is what you harbor, right? What you store. The most important is the gene set that you got from your parents, right? And this is an important gene set for a zillion reasons, among which are it builds and operates you, right? But in addition, it determines what other preens are going to be allowed into you to be stored. And it works very hard on this, but I won't go into it. All right. So the gene set decided to make a, what I call a bacterial gene hotel, your gut, right? So in fact, your gut is full of bacterial genes. And uh, you know, current estimates I've read are you may have 10,000 different species of bacteria in your gut, right? So your gene set, for its own reasons, has decided to surrender some control of you to these bacteria you pick up after you're born. It also built a memes hotel. And that's, of course, your brain. And your brain gets memes uh, at least of two really important types. One is from experience of the world. It also gets what I call societal memes. All right. So you, just like you after your birth become infected with bacteria, you don't have them before your birth, you become infected with societal memes. So for example, you know, religious memes. Some of you may be Hindu, some Muslim, Jewish, Christian, right? Uh, Political memes. Some of you may be Democrats, Republicans, something else, right? Uh, academic memes. You know, some people are experts in uh, the history of Rome or English literature or, you know, computer science, right? You acquired all those memes, right? 
they are in your head, and they affect your behavior immensely, all right? So you have probably millions of memes in your head, right? Okay, so um, how do you get these things? Well, in fact, before you were born, those bacteria were already out there, E. coli, salmonella, all those things. And those meme sets were out there too, all right? And both the bacteria and those meme sets are exquisitely good at infection, okay? So, it, you know, if you expose yourself to any of these things, there's a fairly good chance that you're gonna get infected with them, right? So, uh, there's a lot to be said here, but I don't have the time to say it. So, here you are, you stand, okay, so first of all, Richard Dawkins taught us that genes are selfish. They only care about themselves. They don't really care about you. You're just a vehicle for them to increase their copy number, right? You're just an instrument of theirs. But that's true of all preens, all pre including memes. They only care about themselves and increasing their copy number. So here you stand, you've got probably millions of, me of preens in your body, each of which wants to use you as an instrument to increase its copy number, right? And uh, um, this creates uh, no end to problems. We, every individual stands at the crossroads of all sorts of lines of evolution. And these lines of evolution uh, are not consistent with each other. All right. So let, let me give you a brief example of that from the real world. So here is a picture, a painting of Joan of Arc. And uh, at least in this depiction, she seems to be experiencing some cognitive dissonance, right? And we can understand why, right? And so he, he, you, you know the story, you know, there's a war be, as there usually is between England and France, it's like 1300s. Uh, uh, Joan, uh, you know, has these religious visions. Uh, she rallies the armies of France and, you know, has m lots of followers, blah, blah, blah. But she gets captured by the English and they say, renounce or get burned at the stake, right? So what do her preens say? Well, her gene set, it's a no-brainer, right? Renounce, right? Because if you renounce, you, the maid of Orleans, meaning a virgin, you know, still have a shot at, um, at uh, you know, reproducing me, right? What does her societal meme set said? This collection of memes about, you know, Christianity and France that she has. Well, they say, go get burned at the stake. You'll become a martyr. And all sorts of people will rally to our beliefs, and great, that's what we want. We want new copies of ourselves. So this is not an uncommon situation. You are full of memes, preens, that are, want to control your behavior and are at odds with each other. So the next time you can't sleep at, not, at night because you're not sure what to do about the situation, it's a good chance that you've got memes in your head that are telling you to go one way or telling you to go the other, all right? So a lot of the human condition is based on this stuff. All right, so uh, here's the sort of view. Okay. Preens are like Roman, old-fashioned Roman gods. They are not themselves material, but they carry out their evolution and their wars with one another through material things, including humans, right? And they were here long before you arrived, and they're gonna go on long after you leave. We're just evanescent creatures that are sort of swirling in their wake. And while you're here, they will have a huge impact on your life. Okay, so, boom. All right, I'm done. We have time for a couple of quick questions before the coffee break. Yes, the person who got Rahimi, Rahimi right. So what are we if not a collection of trees? What? what are we if not just a collection of trees? 
oh, we're the apparatus that holds them. You know, the genes uh, tell us how to process them. They build the brain that processes them. I mean, much of my book, you know, is also related to what uh, uh, Manuel was talking about and stuff like that. How does it all work? You know, how does all these preens and memes uh, work? And I think of the memes as sort of being in a memes legislature. And unconsciously, they fight it out for your behavior. Ultimately, you have to behave, right? You have to act in every instance. Uh, and uh, anyway, there's a lot to be said, so I want to say it to Manuel and discuss it with him. Uh, so uh, no, there's the apparatus, and in particular, the brain, the computational part, that has to deal with all these memes, right? Very difficult job. Because it goes from being to being. No, the physical preems are, you know, just to keep the Preens, uh, preens are non-material. Physical things like you and I or that table are physical objects, right? So we are a physical object. We get in, infested with all sorts of preens. Now, the genes built us to deal with that problem. The genes know, knew that we were going to get filled with all these things. So they've given us an operating system and a computer you know, to try to deal with that. And it's very interesting to figure out how they've built us to try to deal with this complexity. It's huge, right? OK, so that's the way I see it. I hope that gives some insight into the answer. Yes? There was one more question in the back, I think. Yes? Uh, as far as I can tell, we're sort of like the cell phone, all right? You get the cell phone. Uh, it has some stuff in it, call it memes of a cell phone, this may be a bad choice. But um, uh, you know, it's got an operating system and all that, right, which is stored. I don't know how it's stored, right? But there's all this memory, you know, gigs now, that has nothing in it. And that's where all your experiential memes and all of the societal memes that infect you end up going, right? So I, I can mumble that about it, but that's probably what, all I can say. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. Uh, I have not thought about that, but you know what I'm saying is what I'm saying, and I think that to look at everything from the gene, gene point of view, especially from just the U gene, the, your parental gene point of view, is wrong. All right. All this is going on, and genes are just another special case of preens, as are memes and as are scenes, right? They all are obeying the same laws. They find you, or they all find you, well, not the scenes, a very nice object if they can get inside and use you to further their aims. That's the way I see it. Yes. Uh, so, because oh oh yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. So um, look, there there is a huge trade-off. For example, you know, even more dramatic is the Shakers. They were a religious sect that grew out of the uh, Quakers in the 1700s in England. Okay, they added a new meme to the meme. Uh, excuse me, a new preen to the. Uh, Quaker preen set. The new preen was no sex, be celibate. Okay? Guess how many shakers there are today? <laughs> You're wrong. Much to my surprise, there are four. Okay? <laughs> but pretty soon, all of our intuitions will be correct. So that's an example where, you know, a preen can, you know, keep people from reproducing. It's anti-gene, very strongly anti-gene, right? And that's what it did. So absolutely, that happens. Mm -hmm. So it's 2.40 now. Let's take a 10-minute break sharp and resume at 2.50. Thank you.